the more it commands our attention until the final, final crescendo has taken place. The crescendo of a new heaven and a new earth. I've entitled my, pat, my message this morning, Babylon Over All. Babylon Over All. It could just as well have been Babylon is everywhere. God gives us the Holy Spirit so that we might know that we are not unnecessary or irrelevant to the work of God in the world, as well as so that we might bear fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And yes, there are also gifts that God's Spirit gives us of prophecy, of service, of leadership, of helps, all kinds of gifts that God gives to help the body of Christ be effectual in this world. If it was not for the Holy Spirit working through especially small churches, because the average church in the world is a small church of about 100 people, God's work would not get done. God's work gets done because of the Holy Spirit working in our world, working in people's lives who surrender themselves to the love and grace and mercy of God. And so this morning, we come to see the enemy of the church. There may be more than one. Certainly, the devil is an enemy of God's work and of God. But there is also something called Mystery Babylon. And we as human beings who are Christians also don't tend to pay enough attention to the world, the flesh, and the devil, particularly the world. And this morning we are entering into the territory of understanding more what God is going to do to this world system that so often hurts and breaks God's people. In fact, kills God's people. What is Babylon overall? What is Mystery Babylon? Do you see that bull that's up there? Do you see that winged bull with the head of a man up there? That is approximately 5,000 years old maybe older. And it comes from the ancient city of Babylon. When I was going to college in Illinois, I went to the Institute, the Oriental Institute. It is a museum of artifacts that have been gathered, especially in uh, the Middle East. And there you can see this 20-ton bull of, of stone carving sitting there in that museum. When I was just perhaps 21, 22 years old, I took a look at that and I never forgot it. Because all of a sudden I realized that the most common city mentioned in the Bible other than Jerusalem is Babylon. And there are all sorts of people who say, you know, the Bible doesn't really tell the truth. But when you think about Babylon, you dig up Babylon history, you dig up Babylon walls, you dig up Babylon um, uh, artifacts, and all of a sudden... You become convinced as you get close, but the museum says, do not touch. But you get close to this, and you see it, and you take a picture of this massive bull picture that was outside the central gate of Babylon. And you start to say, my word, the Bible is supported by history outside of the Bible. And the artifacts that are dug up Help us understand what the Scripture is saying. So when, when the Bible starts to make reference to Babylon in the Old Testament, 
and makes reference to Babylon in the book of Revelation. There was a real Babylon. There is right now an experience of the ruins of Babylon. Look at the extent of the Babylonian Empire around 600 BC. It stretched to include Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Egypt. It was the second global empire in human history. The first was the Akkadian Empire that preceded the Babylonian Empire. And when you go there, you are looking for the hanging gardens of Babylon because they were one of the great seven wonders of the ancient world. Well, they don't exist, but somebody's tried to make it that way again. The hanging gardens of Babylon. Does your house look like this? Well, Nebuchadnezzar and others who were part of Babylon. Daniel, the prophet. They all got to experience this or to be part of this. And now you go and it is just ruins. The Bible talks about how God intended for Babylon to end. There was prophecy that the arrogance, the pride, the, the collective focus on slaves doing the work to make this city was something that incensed God's sense of justice. And so God made sure that all this great city, this whole great empire of Babylon was ruined. You can still see some of the ruins today. It's amazing to me that 4,500 years of history, I mean, America isn't even 500. Add, add beyond America's age another 4,000 years. And there are ruins that can be found in Ur of Chaldees. What is the fall of Babylon all about? Babylon is one of the most often named cities in the Bible. Because of its arrogance and evil so strongly denounced in the Old Testament prophets, it was to be destroyed completely and permanently. This was the plan of the Lord which He had planned against Babylon and His purposes which He had purposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Jeremiah 50, verse 45. Of course, Babylon is not the only city and kingdom to be destroyed by God. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. The prophets, oh, and not to mention Jerusalem, destroyed in 70 A.D., because they rejected Jesus. The prophets compare the destruction of Babylon as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, Jeremiah 50, 40. In the book of Revelation, Rome is called Babylon. And the fall of Rome is predicted just as was the fall of Babylon. Revelation Chapter 17 that we're in, and Babylon falls in just an hour all over again. But this time, it's not Rome. It's the very concept of what a city is all about. That, and, and the pulsating, underlying, demonic force that works through cities all over our planet. When I was younger not that much younger. My father was alive and I reunited with him after many years of separation and several years of trying to find him. And one of the books that I received from him is this book written in 1960 and it's called Uber Al is Babylon. Uber Al is Babylon. It means Babylon is everywhere. And this journalist who wrote this in 1960, Wolf Schneiber, wrote this book about how the concept of Babylon and the city, where they gave laws, Hammurabi's laws, 
and other concepts that made this city and this empire possible. That these ideas traveled to new cities over the world. And he actually has a little map in the back of this book. Here is Babylon. And then it goes to Athens, and then to Alexandria, Egypt, and then to Istanbul, and then to Venice, and then to Lisbon, and then London, and then New York. There are people who believe that America is the modern-day Babylon. You can find this on the internet. There are people who believe that the concepts, the principles of large cities established to take care of people, but also to raise up the pride of humanity, include San Francisco. And we are part of that great city. And so this morning, I am recognizing that people long before me have written about the concept of Babylon and the principles of the spiritual force of Babylon in our world. Jesus talked uh, through the, the letter, first letter of John about the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're talking about the world right here. And interestingly enough, one of the famous philosophers, Bertrand Russell, said this, from Babylon come some things that belong to science. The division of the day into 24 hours. Have you ever wondered why? Our day is divided into 24 hours. It goes back to Babylon. And this, of the circle into 360 degrees. Also the discovery of a cycle of ellipses, which enable lunar eclipses to be predicted with certainty and solar eclipses with some probability. That allows for good farming techniques and for planning of agriculture and for the foundation of cities. This Babylonian knowledge, as we shall see, was acquired by Thales, Thales of Miletus in Greece. And so these ideas of human culture have been passing on, and they're not necessarily evil ideas, but together in the hands of powerful dictatorial kinds of men, they have been a means of gathering wealth and gathering uh, the ability to do commerce with the rest of the world and then subjugate people because dictators always want to control everything. So this morning, as we think about Mystery Babylon, we realize that it is a mystery that still exists to some day today. Can the mystery of the whore of Babylon be solved? Yes, at least partially, the horror of Babylon is an evil world system controlled by the Antichrist during the last days before Jesus' return. The horror of Babylon also has religious connotations, spiritual adultery, false religions, with the beast being the focus of an ungodly end times religious system. And so we realize that when politics of the city are married with a certain particular religion that may be toxic, it all becomes a brew that the Bible calls Mystery Babylon. The book that I have in German says, Über alles Babylon, die Stadt, als Schicksal des Menschen von Ur bis Utopia. What does that mean? It means Babylon is everywhere, the city is the destiny of people from Ur of Chaldees until Utopia. Now this was not a Christian guy who was writing this book, but that's the title of this book. Here it is in English. And so we consider, what does this have to do with us getting some principles, some insight, some perspective on the final days of humanity? Well, in chapter 17, it says this. Come out of her, my people. Revelation 17, 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city 
which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, 2. With whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. But here's where the real focus is. I saw that the woman, verse 6, was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. You see, the whole book of Revelation is built around the fulcrum of the testimony of God's people who are martyrs praying to God and saying, God, please take over and stop the evil from continuing. I have witnessed faithfully, and oh God, please take me into heaven and please stop the evil. And so the driving force of revelation is the blood of the martyrs and the prayers of the martyrs. And this morning we realize that there's a whole world system that if you peel back the layers, moves in the direction of immorality rather than loving and acknowledging the greatness of God. This morning as we think about that, we realize that that we may have seen the peeling back of Babylon in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. I don't know. I leave it to you to consider. But there is, there is a move in our world towards things that are death-oriented and immorality-oriented rather than life-oriented and godliness-oriented. If you want life and godliness, you have to fight for life and godliness. You have to walk with the Lord. You have to trust in the Lord. If you don't, you will slide in the direction of death and immorality. It's sort of like being on an escalator. It's always going down. And if you don't step up the steps a little faster, you're not going to get to the top. Yeah, that's true. One, two, there we are again. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise be to God and his servant, Bert. Amen. So I was in Holly, West Hollywood, Beverly Hills. Interestingly enough, the Lions Club log cabin building is on ground in Beverly Hills, but it is kind of owned by West Hollywood. And this Lions Club project is the worst looking building in Hollywood, in Beverly Hills. And we're walking to, to go to dinner at all these swanky restaurants that you're walking by. And my gosh, all these beautiful people in their, their fancy clothes and jewelry. And, you know, they're just young and perfect and everything. And then you see this building. But the doors were open and we got to look inside as were hundreds of people in there. What were people doing in this ugly building? Hundreds of people in there doing AA meetings. 
alcohol and drug recovery meetings. Thousands of people have gone to these recovery meetings because Beverly Hills isn't necessarily a good place for the health of the human soul. And they, the city, are thinking about tearing down this building. And there was such an uproar of people all over the area that they demanded that they keep this building because it is a place to come together and get encouragement, advice, and support for overcoming alcoholism and all the problems that come with it. And so we realize that the human soul can only have so much of drunkenness. The human soul can only have so much of immorality, and then the, your life falls apart. One, two, three, that's still working. And God has these little places where you can go. This is the secular church in Beverly Hills. More people go to this place than any church anywhere around Beverly Hills or Hollywood. It's always full because it's open 24-7 with young people going in there and getting help for their addictions. God has something to say to the city. We live in an unparalleled time. God loves the people of the cities of this world. It is not the city itself that is the problem. It is when evil manifests through the city and people lose touch with God because they're mesmerized by the power and the dynamics and the energy of what takes place in certain cities. Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride will be like when Yahweh overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. There is the prophecy that Babylon will be overturned. And what is the, what is the remedy for us who are Christians? 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 has a lot to say to us. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So the antidote to all the pride of Babylon is for us to humble ourselves. That includes me, that includes us, that includes everybody in Sonoma, that includes everybody in America. When I watch the Olympics, I'm excited to see human performance at its best. But I'm not always excited to see enormous pride. But I got to tell you, I had an amazing experience watching something that is brand new to the Olympics. It's breakdancing. I don't know if you've seen breakdancing, but I want to tell you that I was not only impressed with the contortions to music that these young men were displaying which are phenomenal. But I got to tell you, when those young guys were meeting each other and then afterwards they were embracing, they were caring for each other, they were saying, good job. You could see it in their eyes, the generosity of spirit for the little community in the world of people who do this breakdancing. Now, there's not a single person in this room, I'm sure, that wants to do breakdancing. But underlying that was a spirit of generosity, care, and energy of these young people wishing each other well, even though they just may have defeated that person in their Olympic display of, of dancing. I gotta say, I couldn't believe the sportsmanship. It was awesome. It was incredible. I thought that might have been the best thing I could possibly see. And I've not been watching the Olympics very much. But wow, these young people hugging each other, encouraging each other, and blessing each other. There's a humility that I saw there. Perhaps they know they won't be able to do that for very long, what they're doing. And it makes me wonder, all the contortions we do 
as Christians and all the contortions we do, break dancing in our own way, wanting to get attention. But is there mercy? Is there kindness? Is there love? It's time to say goodbye. That was the title of the song we heard as we opened the service. Time to say goodbye. Bid goodbye to Babylon because the Bible in Revelation 17 says there is coming a time when all the world system is going to have God pull the plug on it. And that's why we're called to sing, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, rather than to be false, idolatrous people of the things of this world. So this morning, as I think about all of this and the practical application, I'm reminded that we've got to hold all things loosely in our hands. If God has given you a house, if God has given you something of material wealth, know that it won't always necessarily be there. Just a couple weeks ago, we put a marker stone in the ground at Oak Hill Cemetery in San Jose for my wife's mother. We placed the ashes in the ground. The stone was laid. We prayed, and we were finally done a year of planning since she passed away. And she passed away from pancreatic cancer and had her diagnosis, and 30 days later she had passed. It was very quick. We've been grieving for a year. And my mother-in-law still has a profound effect on Charlotte and on I and her family and friends. And so we recognize that everything is going to pass away but people remember the love that you expressed while you were alive. May we not be beguiled by Babylon. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would do a marvelous work to help us realize where our comfort lies and where our clarity lies and where our wisdom lies and where our strength lies. Lord God, help us not to rest on Babylon, but to rest in all that you do on earth. There is not a kingdom that exists that is not under your hand. Oh, Lord God, we pray that you would help us to seek the best for the people of Sonoma, to love the people of Sonoma, because you are a Lord God Almighty, and you love them, and you don't want them to slip away into a Christless eternity. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to walk with you, knowing that you have all the power at your fingertips. You rule from the center of the cosmos, and we are called to lift up your greatness through mercy. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing this song with me, please? Thank you.